People are tired. People are weary. The next person that can happen to is their children. <laughs> I'm tired of my black men and my black women being shot, being killed by the NYPD. I'm tired of it. I have three black men in my home. I'm tired. I am tired. My black brothers and sisters are being shot, being killed for no reason. What we've seen over the last two days and the emotion-ridden conflict over last night is the result of so much built-up anger and sadness. Michael Brown, Felino Castile, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, Doug Lewis, Sean Reed, and so many more have been lost at the hands of white supremacy and racism and police brutality. Welcome to this special Washington Post Live. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for the Washington Post. And with me is our special guest, House Majority Whip James Clyburn of South Carolina. He served in Congress for almost 30 years and is a senior member and former chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. He's also the chairman of the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis. A revered leader in South Carolina politics, Clyburn has long fought for civil rights even being elected president of his NAACP youth chapter at the age of 12, he was literally married to the civil rights movement because it was in jail where he met his beloved and uh, late wife, Emily. Um, the, you guys were married how long, Congressman? 58 years. 58 years. And I had the pleasure of meeting her several times, and she yeah. definitely was the power behind the, <laughs> the power oh, behind the hand. Absolutely. She loved you so much. Oh. Uh, she talked about you all the time. Oh, thank thank you. you. And thank you again for being here. We've got a lot of news to, to get to. Obviously, there's a lot going on. And I want to get your reaction to the news that it was Attorney General Bill Barr who ordered, the law, enfor ordered law enforcement to clear Lafayette Square in order for the president to go over to St. John's Church? Uh, that was very, very disappointing, but not surprising. Uh, I said a couple of days ago, the Bill Barr auditioned, really auditioned in a letter uh, to Donald Trump, uh, offering in so many words to be Donald Trump's Roy Cohn. That is a role. Uh, that he is playing. Uh, he is not embarrassed about it at all. He seemed to be relishing in it. Uh, and so uh, disappointing, uh, but not surprised. Now let's talk about Defense Secretary Mark Esper. Um, he said in an interview that he had, quote, no idea that force would be used to clear out the protesters. Should he resign? Well, um, I don't know uh, if I would go, I don't ever uh, ask anybody to resign. I do ask people to take stock of what they are doing and see whether or not it squares uh, with what their understanding of what this country is all about. I don't believe that if he were to take stock of that, uh, he would agree uh, in office if that's what he cannot square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you make of President Trump's request to take control of the DC Police Department, something that Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, resisted? I think the mayor uh, is a stand-up person, and I thank her for standing up to this president. Uh, sometimes you can't just speak truth to power. It is what you do. Uh, you demonstrate it, uh, and she demonstrated it in this instance. That is beyond uh, the authority of the President of the United States. Uh, he has treated 
and many of my Republican colleagues have seen to treat uh, the D.C. Uh, government or District of Columbia itself uh, as if it's as their own uh, little uh, place to abode or abide whenever they want to. Uh, we went through that. Uh, I really got forcefully involved in politics as a part of our trying to get rid of that mentality, that plantation mentality. In fact, former Congressman John McMillan, who held the seat that I currently hold, uh, he uh, chaired the D.C. committee uh, for years and treated the District of Columbia as if it were a plantation. We're still denying the people uh, in the District of Columbia uh, the right uh, for full citizenship mm -hmm. uh, with a vote, with representation. Uh, so I think that um, uh, what we see here is the furtherance of that. And it's a shame uh, that this president uh, doesn't have most uh, appreciation for what this country is all about than that. So in two two successive days, we have seen church leaders come out and, and criticize, if not outright condemn President Trump for using religious buildings or shrines uh, for political purposes. You had the, 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 the head of the Episcopal Church, um, Reverend Booty, here in Washington condemning the president using the, the church as a photo op holding up the Bible, St. John's Church. And then you had um, the, the Washington's Archbishop, Wilton Gregory, uh, criticizing the president for going to the shrine of St. John, St. Pope John Paul II. Let me get your reaction to religion, well, one, to the president doing what he did in front of those religious um, institutions, and, and two, to the president using them as photo ops. Well, you, as you know, I grew up in apostasy. My father was a fundamentalist minister. I'm a very active uh, member of the African Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, I, um, I read the Bible uh, a whole lot. Uh, I study the Bible in a historical context uh, away from uh, what the examples are that you ought to live by. And I noticed the Speaker Pelosi mentioned something this morning and maybe on yesterday as well. Uh, and she may have had reference to this. There in the book of Ecclesiastes, the, uh, uh, the preacher, so to speak, uh, we're told there's a time and a place for everything under the sun. And there's a time uh, that we ought to do certain things and there's time we ought not do certain things. There's never a time, however, to misuse religion. Mm -hmm. This president seemed to think the religion is some kind of prop uh, to further his political interests. To go out and hold up a Bible in front of a sanctuary uh, and to have a cadre of people following you. The, the thing that got me about that more than anything else is the way uh, they marched over to that church. Mm -hmm. Not to kneel, not to go inside and pray, but to stand in front of and hold a Bible up in the most awkward way that I've ever seen and then call people over for a photo op in front of the church. There was something real weird about mm -hmm. all of that. And I think that people, if they had not given any real thought uh, to whether uh, as we sit down here in the South, whether or not this president is wrapped tight, I think that, that should have told them everything they needed to know. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman, what do you make? Let's talk about the, the, the protests ov overall. And for those of you who are watching at home, the sun is reflecting uh, on my face through through my blinds. But I would, Congressman, I want to get your reaction to, or, or what do you make of the protests that have been happening nationwide over now the last nine days? Well, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like this since maybe uh, Emmett Till. Uh, I do believe that that was a defining moment uh, in uh, this country's uh, history. I think this was a defining moment. Uh, I think that um, what George Floyd uh, just went through what his family is going through, what his child will live through. 
uh, are all indicators of why this country needs to rise up and take stock of where we are, what we stand for, and really uh, make some determinations about how we can live out the rest of this year. Here we are trying to get over uh, the worst healthcare crisis we've had in over a hundred years. And in the middle of it, we now got the worst social problem that we've had in maybe 60 or 70 years. And so this is a double whammy that we had better take stock of right away and decide how we get through this. We cannot get through this pitted against each other. We must stand in solidarity with each other. We've got to think seriously about how we are going to restructure our healthcare system, restructure our educational system, how we are going to make the real greatness of this country accessible and affordable for everybody. Our judicial system is crying out for restructuring. And I think that what we see here uh, is an indication of uh, some of the things we've got to do and do rather way. The Congressional <laughs> Black Caucus is doing some marvelous work. Hakeem Jeffries, our chair, uh, has been uh, pushing the bill for a long time now to outlaw the chokehold, which has been outlawed in plenty of places. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't been able to get traction on that bill. But I want to see that bill go further than that. It can't just be the chokehold. We got to look at all neck restraints. What are you trying to do when you keep a, your knee on a victim's neck with another uh, policeman, a knee in his back, and another with a third knee across his legs? What are you trying to do? He's being accused of passing a $20, a counterfeit $20 bill. Is it worth doing that? $20? Well, Congress, Congressman, on this point, all of the things that you are bringing up are, are right, true, and fair. But in order for them to happen, for Congressman Jeffries' bill to actually become law, it has got to get through the House, which is Democratic right. controlled. But then it's got to go over to the Senate which is Republican controlled and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has shown he is not interested in much except for confirming judges. And then you've got to get a president to sign it. And so I want to bring in this question from Beth Law from Virginia, um, where she asks, why are so many Republicans in safe districts and seats unwilling to stand up for the beliefs that led them into politics and instead toady to Trump's odious positions, language, and disrespect for the Constitution and a Republican form of Republican form of government. Um, you know, it is amazing that you have um, the other half of our American system of the, the two political parties that is relatively silent, whether they're in safe seats or not. Your Republican colleagues aren't saying anything about the president and what he's doing. A lot of them, I should say. Yes, a lot of them. I, I, I try to uh, really be careful uh, how I respond to that, because I talk to a lot of them, and I, I know uh, that they are torn uh, between what they think their constituents may want them to do and what they really feel in their heart they should do. And I know that's always a problem uh, when it comes to uh, elected officials. Uh, should you uh, be there uh, to represent or to reflect the thought process that's going on in your congressional district. And so many of them believe uh, that this president is much more popular in uh, their districts than he demonstrates that he is. The fact of the matter is we had a senator uh, uh, up in what Nebraska uh, who just uh, won uh, by a 50 uh, vote percent margin, uh, mm -hmm. but he was afraid uh, all for the last year to speak out against this president when he had spoken out against him before. Uh, we have here in South Carolina a, a, a senator who said when this president was running for office uh, that he was one of the worst things that ever happened uh, to the Republican Party. 
And all of a sudden now in the last year or two, saying he's the best thing that's happened uh, to the world uh, in the way he, he acts on Instagram has been acting. I don't know, they seem to feel that this guy has some uh, mystical powers uh, over the thought process in their, in their districts. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that's coming from. I don't feel that when I talk to people. I think when you look at the voting results here in South Carolina, in, in the uh, Democratic primary, there were people voting in the Democratic primary from these suburban uh, federal voting, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Republican voting districts uh, that never voted before. People are not in tune with this president. And I think that it's time for the Republicans to understand the voting public feels that this country is more important than any one person. Mm -hmm. And for them to uh, make the country subservient uh, to this guy is beyond any understanding that I'm, uh, I'm capable of, of having. Uh, let's bring it back to to the demonstrations. And as I said in the intro, and as anyone who knows you knows, you are a a a product and a child of the civil rights movement from the 1950s and 1960s. What is your reaction? What is your message to those who are usurping this movement that we see now to commit acts of violence and looting? Because there is a difference between those who are demonstrating and those who are, who are looting. Well, no, thanks for uh, asking that question because, you know, uh, John Lewis and I have talked about this a whole lot. I remember back uh, in 1960, John Lewis and I first met in October 1960. We were founding members uh, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that became known as SNCC. John and I talked about this a lot. We often said uh, that we suffered in that movement because of two things. One, there was a group of people who exploited the movement. But number two, there was a group of people who hijacked the movement. And, and when you have these kinds of activities going on, everybody that gets involved ain't necessarily there uh, with a real uh, purpose. We have a purpose when we go out uh, to protest. When, but then there are people who will use that uh, as a, a sort of a shelter cover to do other things. And so we have to be very careful in this movement, especially uh, with social media all around us, because so much of what we say and do gets weaponized against us. And so we know that happened back in uh, 2016. So we've got to make sure that we do not allow uh, ourselves to play the other person's game. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up playing sport as well. Uh, I was not as good a football player as I should have been, but a pretty good baseball player. But one thing I did learn, if your opponent gets you to play his or her game on his or her turf, they will win. That I know for sure. And we cannot allow anybody to come into this movement. Peaceful protest is our game. Violence is their game. Purposeful protest is our game. This looting and rioting, that's their game. We cannot allow ourselves to play their game. So I say to young people all the time, we should stand together in solidarity for that which we know to be the purpose for our existence. And that is to make a better country a better world for those who must come after us. Mm -hmm. Breaking out a window will not contribute to that. Setting the fire, throwing stones at police officers, that's destructive behavior, which will not contribute to anything uh, that will make this a better country and make a better future for our children and our grandchildren. Well, so I tell my uh, daughters all the time, just think about what you're doing. And Congress ask yourself the question, will this make things better or worse? Well, Congressman, this is a good segue to talk about former Vice President Joe Biden, who is the presumptive Democratic nominee, who is someone who is hoping to replace 
um, President Trump. He's someone you uh, famously endorse, and everyone credits you and your endorsement just before the South Carolina primary as resurrecting his campaign um, from from defeat, as a lot of people were seeing it then. Do you think Vice President Biden is doing everything he should be doing right now as a candidate, as a leader in the party, and as a statesman? Well, I think that he's getting there. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, you're right. The campaign uh, really uh, was not was in the catch-22. Uh, you got to raise money in order to run the campaign. But then if you don't know run the campaign the way people like to see it uh, run, uh, then you know, uh, they won't give the money. And so uh, I think that after Super Tuesday, the campaign got recharged. Then this pandemic hit. And here we are. Uh, not being, uh, uh, Joe Biden's long suit is what we call retail politics. Going out, interacting with people. And got accused of interacting a little too much, but that's his long suit. Now he's got to hunker down. He's got to uh, can't go out the way he want to. Uh, but I think he's getting his legs now because all of a sudden uh, he uh, is now comfortable looking in that camera and connecting with people uh, the way we are connecting here today. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was very effective. Uh, in his speech on yesterday, and he'll get much better at that as we go on. And I think that he's going to do uh, do everything uh, that needs to be elected. But you're right; uh, he had to get comfortable with that. This is well, new for all of us. You know, Joe Biden and I, of course, I'm older than Joe, uh, so I, I know that this this business it takes a little getting used to. But mm -hmm. I'm loving it. I'm really loving it. Uh, well, as you can probably tell. Yes, I can tell. I, I, I recognize that 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 impish smile <laughs> there and what that means. Um, you know, I said this morning on Morning Joe that I think that actually President Trump is playing Vice President Biden's game because when Vice President Biden launched his campaign, he focused on Charlottesville and he focused on the divisions that President Trump <clears throat> had been exploiting. And he was talking about the soul of America. And we've got all of that happening, all of that happening right now. So despite not being able to do retail politics and things, do you think Vice President Biden in this moment that we're in, is he meeting the challenge? Well, there are a couple of things I think that uh, are still to come. Uh, for instance, uh, he's talked about this, his um, uh, program for African-American uh, community, uh, Lift Every Voice. Uh, I think that has to be fleshed out in such a way that I think it's very, uh, my 10, 20, 30, for instance. I think that if people were to really understand that, spending at least 10% 10 of all this money that's being appropriated in those areas where 20% or more of the population is stuck beneath the poverty level for the last 30 years. Now, it's the Census Bureau that's defined persistent poverty communities as communities of 20 percent or more of the, of the population been stuck beneath the poverty level for the last 30 years. That's not 10 percent, I mean 20 percent uh, or more of African Americans, that's of everybody. So when Joe Biden adopted the 10, 20, 30, I think that what he's going to have to do or should do uh, is go out and get people to understand what that means. If you in Kentucky, for instance, He's got to show them how his 10, 20, 30 program will mean more for Kentuckians than what Mitch McConnell is doing. He's got to go uh, up to, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Arizona uh, and get people in the, the Latino community to understand what that means for their communities. So I think that um, he's laid out the programs. He's not fleshed it out. Uh, enough because he's not been able to get out there. Mm -hmm. That's why I think you're going to see over the next several weeks some real enunciations of the programs that he uh, or, or he is proposing uh, for the people that live in these communities. So I think that uh, Joe Biden is going to set a tremendous tone. Uh, his speech yesterday uh, right. reminded me of another speech in Philadelphia several years ago. Yes, Con Congressman, we're, we're running out of time. We've got six minutes, and I want to give you ample time to answer this very predictable question. You, Your <laughs> early support of Vice President Biden helped him secure the path to the nomination, which I've already noted. But you've also said before that 
his selection of an African-American woman, because he's already said that he's going to choose a woman, but you've gone on record as saying that Biden's selection of a, of a black woman for VP was, quote, not a must. So in, I wonder, one, has, that, has your view on that changed given where we are and what's happening in the country right now? And two, have you talked with Vice President Biden recently about his thinking in terms of a, of a running mate? Well, uh, you're right about that. That's exactly what I said. But I also said, but it would be a plus. It's not a must, but it would be a plus. That's what I believe. I've said that over and over again. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, is going to give uh, the kind of consideration to every woman uh, that is uh, out there uh, that needs to be given, black, brown, and white. Uh, I, Michelle Lujan, down in New Mexico, is an outstanding woman. I understand her name has been put out there. In fact, I mentioned it before, and she's being vetted. Uh, I, I think that uh, Kamala Harris is great. I think uh, Stacey Abrams, Keisha uh, Lance Bottoms, uh, Val Demons, uh, uh, Karen Bass, Marsha Fudge, all these are outstanding women, and I think they will uh, get their proper due. But I think it would be a mistake for us to say what must happen when we have no idea what will show up in the polling, what will show up in the, uh, in the vetting. The only thing that's a must in this process at this time is to win. That's the must. It'll be a plus to have an African-American woman. Uh, it'll be a plus to have uh, a Latina. And it'll be a plus to have a woman. But just remember, it will not be the first time. Uh, Sarah Payton uh, turned out uh, not to be a, a good choice uh, when the Venom took place. Uh, we had the same problem with Geraldine Ferraro. She was an outstanding woman. But when they start, uh, they did the vetting of her, but didn't do proper vetting of her husband. And that turned out to be a problem. So what I want us to do is let everybody be considered, do the vetting, do the polling, and then uh, after all that's done, then let your heart and your head take a look. I think he calls it simpatico. One of the mm -hmm. first things that the vote, voting public will see is whether or not the chemistry is there. Take uh, the, the whole uh, presidency of, of Bill Clinton and the vice presidency of Al Gore. A lot of people say that was a big mistake. Both of them from the same right. region of the country, they don't compliment each other. But when they met before the public, they did compliment each other. That's the kind of stuff that has to go into this. So what seems obvious uh, sometimes may not be so uh, when the public looks at it. Right. So a lot has to go into this choice. Uh, I don't want us to ever tell anybody what they must do. Let's <laughs> tell them what they should do. Well, I mean, you did, I mean, well, I'm going to leave that for, for another time. <laughs> let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. Um, a lot of people are wondering when this announcement is going to be made. Some people make the argument that, the, that Vice President Biden should name his running mate as soon as possible so that they the two can hit the ground running and take the fight to, to President Trump and Vice President Pence. Others say, drag it out for as long as you can so as to not give the Trump campaign a target, extra time to go after that running mate. Vice President Biden, you, you're talking to him. What do you advise him to do in terms of not who he should select, but when he should make that selection known? Well, one of the things I learned down here, growing up in the South, those old adages I live by, haste makes waste. I'm advising not to be hasty. Let's take our time, let's do the vetting, let's do the polling, and let's, really, now this vetting is more than just trying to look into people's backgrounds. Uh, you got to vet uh, the choice with a few of the people that you respect around the country. Uh, that's part of this process, making sure you get somebody that will excite uh, your base as well 
uh, as uh, the independent voters that are out here. So there's more to this vetting than just looking at people's right. bank accounts. So uh, I don't uh, want us to be too hasty with this. Let's check out times and let's get it right. Congressman, my, my last question to you, and in, in 30 seconds, what do you say to African-American voters out there if Vice President, Vice President Biden's running mate isn't, isn't an African-American woman, what do you say to those black voters who would be, would be really um, um, upset by that decision and might be contemplating um, either not voting or not, not doing the work that the party needs to get people out to vote? I would say what I've always said, uh, that we have to win this election. This is about uh, electing a president uh, that will be what this country is all about. But this is also about getting rid of a president that is just anathema uh, to all of our uh, futures in this country. So uh, I uh, might be disappointed in the choice, but I'm certainly not going to disengage from this process. The issues at hand is much bigger than race. It is much bigger than gender. It is what this country is all about. I'm very hopeful that the choice will be somebody that all of us can rally around and be proud of, but that the country can rally around and be proud of as well. House Majority Whip James Clyburn of the great state of South Carolina. Thank you very much for being here for this Washington Post Live uh, mobile event. And thank, thank you, you for tuning in for this important discussion this afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern. My colleague David Ignatius uh, will speak with the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, about its response to the global pandemic. On Thursday, former Democratic presidential candidate Senator Cory Booker will join national political reporter Robert Costa to continue the discussion about racial justice in America and offer his legislative plans for police reform. Head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and learn more about upcoming discussions. Again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. See you soon.